Good afternoon. We know, of course, that there is but one truth. But since all of the truth that has ever been revealed in the history of the world takes up such a small space, it is impossible for the world to grasp it. And therefore, there are studies, revelations, principles which lead to the realization and demonstration of truth. It would be a very simple matter to publish in the newspapers and magazines of the world the entire truth of being every day. It would only require enough space to print three letters of the alphabet. And that is all the truth that has ever been discovered in the history of the world. Just that which can be embraced within three letters of the alphabet. And at one time, King Solomon wanted to give this truth. He felt it was important that the world know this truth, and so he decided to reveal it. Moses had concealed it. Moses had decided that only those who had reached a consciousness of high priest would be ready to know the truth, to understand it and demonstrate it. And so he forbade the teaching of truth and permitted it to be known only by those who attained the rank of high priest. But King Solomon thought that it should not be so limited, that it should be revealed to others, and he decided that if those interested in knowing the truth would work with him over a certain period of years, that they would attain the necessary consciousness so that he could reveal the truth. And his plan never came off. It proved that he was wrong and that the world could not receive truth. Then, when the few Hebrew sects that had the truth locked up within themselves made it compulsory for their high priests and rabbis never to divulge the truth, never to permit the world to know the truth. There was a long period when no one had access to truth except the few who attained a sufficient degree of spiritualized consciousness to be able to grasp it. And one of these bodies was the Essens, the order of Essens. And they had the secret, but they also forbade even their own people to have it, except those who were at the top level of the priesthood. One of these was Jesus. But Jesus likewise felt that this is a sin, hiding this from the world. This should be given to mankind. It should be revealed so that everyone would be free, physically free, mentally, morally, financially, because to know the truth does set one free, completely free of physical, mental, moral, and financial limitations. And 
he left this body of Essenes to go out into Judea and teach in the synagogues by the wayside, by the seaside, in the mountains, and the plains, wherever two or more would gather together to hear him. And he revealed to them the truth for which he was very promptly crucified. Because there again, authorities can never afford to permit the world to know the truth because it no longer has a control over mankind when mankind knows the truth, for it makes them free. And therefore, in order to be sure that control is continued over people, it is necessary to keep them in ignorance of truth. And so he was crucified. And he was crucified for telling the truth. Now then, a strange thing happened probably for the first time in the history of the world. No, it wasn't the first. It was the second time. For the second time in the history of the world, a group of people began to know the truth. The first time was in the experience of Gautama the Buddha. Gautama the Buddha succeeded in imparting ultimate truth to several hundred of his students and they performed the greatest healing works ever revealed on earth. Not that they exceeded in quality the, he the healings of Jesus Christ, but they exceeded in quantity anything ever accomplished by the Christian followers. They went the length and breadth of India and the healing works were miraculous. And not only the healing of physical claims, but setting men free within their own being. <clears throat> Before Gautama the Buddha passed on at the age of 80, his secret was lost. It was probably one of the reasons that he decided to leave this earth, for it is said that he was not ill and he wasn't old. He was 80 years of age, but not old in his body or mind. But he was weary of what had happened among his disciples. He was weary of the truth that was being lost. And he realized the hopelessness of mankind ever learning the truth. And so it is said that he called his disciples together and said, I'm leaving you tonight, and tonight he left. <clears throat> but Christ Jesus revealed this truth to his followers, and evidently the truth registered with a few, or a very few, but a few. And thereby, the healing works were carried on for three centuries. But meantime, of course, the truth was lost again, and for the same reason, there was dissension inside of the Christian movement. In other words, there was the side headed by Paul, who felt that truth should be available to everybody, Jew and Gentile. And then there were the sects headed by Peter and James who felt that no one but Hebrews were entitled to know the truth. And then, of course, Peter later came around to Paul's way of seeing things, but James never did give in, nor his followers. And so it was that the internal dissension plus the persecution from outside began to uh, break the awareness of this truth and again it disappeared from the face of the earth. So that we know this, the truth of God is foolishness with man. And we know that man in his humanhood can never receive truth until man 
rises above his humanhood until he has the Spirit of God dwelling in him, he cannot discern the nature of truth and truth becomes foolishness to him. Therefore, in every approach to truth that has ever been revealed, the first step that is necessary is developing consciousness to the place where that consciousness can receive the truth. In other words, you give the milk of the word to the babes. You give the meat of the word to those prepared to receive it. And heaven help you, if you attempt to give the meat to the babes, you find that the babes will crucify you again. In their innocence, but a knife in the back is just as dangerous when uh, put there by innocence as with guilt. And the crucifixion of the Master was a crucifixion even though it was done by those in ignorance of the truth. Now, the truth itself is one. And anyone who does not ultimately reveal the one truth is not revealing truth at all. But there are many, many ways of reaching that truth. There are many approaches to the truth. One can reach truth through an emotional religion, a religion in which there is really no truth at all, but there is so much of emotion that it can ultimately elevate one to the truth, and this is probably one of the poorest ways of reaching it. There is a way of reaching truth through the mind, using the mind as an instrument through which one ultimately attains realization. And of course in India, they also attempt to attain it through the body and the control of the body. So it is that whether one attempts to attain union with God through a physical yoga, a mental yoga, a yoga of service, or the final one, the royal road, which is spiritual attainment, all roads lead to the truth. So it is then that we in this age have been given a wonderful opportunity to realize truth. In fact, I would say that the best opportunity that has ever been given to the world is given in this age. The world has been given an opportunity to work through the mind to the spirit, through an intellectual understanding of truth, to the spiritual discernment of truth. And the question remains with each person to find the approach that most nearly is acceptable to their own state of consciousness. There is no such thing as any one approach to truth that will meet the needs of everybody. And it is my conviction that there never will be, because we are all different states and stages of consciousness. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different experiences in pre-existence, that is, our existence before we came to earth. And therefore, we cannot all attain the top through the same approach. For this reason, then, since the religious life is such a sacred one, each person should learn to go within themselves and pray for light and guidance to be directed to their particular path. And then when it has been revealed to them, give that path every opportunity to fulfill itself. 
and do not pass from that path to another except under divine guidance because there is that within us which can lead us home if we continue to follow the leading that is within us. If we begin to listen to our neighbor or just to follow some popular approach or some approach that has performed miracles for someone else, we are not really being divinely guided. We are only divinely guided when something within ourselves says, this is the way walk ye in it. It says nothing about your neighbor. It says walk ye in it. Now, it is for this reason that the principles contained in the message of the infinite way represent only my personal experience and the fruitage of it in my practice and teaching. For 13 years before my first spiritual experience, I was seeking, but I was seeking in ignorance, not knowing how to seek or where to seek, not knowing even what to seek. It was 13 years of chaos internally and externally but behind those 13 years and during those 13 years there was at least an inner urge that says there is a God and God can be found everything else in life was chaotic but that particular principle never wavered there is a God and God can be found stick to it and then on a specific day the experience took place and it was an experience of transformation because from the moment of that experience I literally not figuratively I literally died to my entire human experience in other words within uh, 18 months I died to my business or it died to me it was completely gone within 18 months I died to every form of life that I was living smoking social drinking card playing far too much theaters all of human experience in that one experience died and every bit of yesterday disappeared and a whole new way of life began with uh, rarely a memory of yesterday. Even uh, my relatives dropped away, my friends dropped away, and eventually I was left totally alone in the world without a relative, without a friend, and without a dollar. And it was then that the new life began. Now then, from that day to this, my life has been a continuous experience of religious revelations, inner unfoldments, and experiences. And all of these are embodied in certain principles which have been given for practice and study. And whether or not they have relationship to anything else that's been printed on the subject, is of no importance to me because of what it has done for my life and for those who in 30 years, 31 this year, my 31st year, has been brought into my experience. The very first and probably the most important of these working principles is due to the fact that I had a revelation as to the cause of error, the origin of evil, and what to do with it and how to do with it. And all of our work is based on that basic revelation which has to do with the nature of evil 
the origin of evil and how to deal with it. And that is the most important point in the entire teaching of the infinite way. If I were to say to you, which is truth, that God is all, that uh, is not only truth, but you know that. And if I were to say that God is omnipresent, you know that. And so does all the rest of the world. And if I say God is omnipotence, you know that too, and so does all the rest of the world. Even if I were to go further and say that God is closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet, you know that, and so does all the rest of the world. But knowing all of that, your sins, diseases, death, lack, and limitation still goes on, and so does that of the world. Knowing that God is all does not stop the processes of sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation. Knowing that God is closer to you than breathing doesn't do it. Knowing that God is omnipotence and omnipresence doesn't do it because all of those things are taught in every religion in the world. And yet wars go on and depressions and panics and cancer and all the rest of these things. So that there must be something beyond that no, there isn't. If that could be realized, not mentally stated or agreed with, if that could be realized, God is all, oh, well, then that would be all that is necessary for the establishing of harmony in our being. But it is so rare that an individual ever attains the realization that God is all to a demonstrable degree that you would probably have difficulty remembering the names of three people in the last 2,000 years who have attained it. I couldn't name three. Offhand, I can't name two. And I'm trying hard to think of one. And yet it is the truth that the realization of God as all is sufficient. Now then, since it is not sufficient to make harmony demonstrable in our experience. There must be some principle, there must be some law, there must be some way that will make it possible for us to overcome sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation within ourselves and within those who turn to us. And this first religious experience, of which I've told you, was the realization that enabled me to heal and ena enabled me to change physically, mentally, morally, and financially. My whole being and life changed through that realization without knowing any principles. The experience itself did it. Now, when people came to me, and they were drawn to me beginning two days after that spiritual experience, when they were drawn to me for help, I could give it to them. They could be healed, but they were no better off than they were before, except that they had more physical harmony. In other words, they didn't know what did it, they didn't know how to be able to hold it, they didn't know how to continue it in their experience, and I couldn't teach them, for I didn't know. And so it was that my life became a dedication to meditation so that I might learn the laws. I couldn't learn them externally because I haven't been able to find them anywhere. And so I had to go within to see if it could be revealed to me what it was that brought these experiences. And of course, the result of these meditations, the result of these many, many spiritual experiences, some of which have lasted for a period of two whole months, some three days, some one day, some five days, these are embodied in my writings. The first and most important one deals with the origin of evil, the nature of evil, 
and how to deal with it. And strangely enough, this contradicts every metaphysical teaching that is on the face of the earth today. This is a direct contradiction of the principles that are ordinarily taught because it says this, all evil, regardless of its name or nature, is impersonal. And that means that it is not your wrong thinking that has caused your trouble. And it is not your envy or jealousy or malice. It is not your sensuality. It is not your lack of gratitude. It is not your uh, anything. There isn't a single thing in you that is responsible for any of your ills. And the very moment that you seek within yourself or within your patient for the cause of the trouble, you are helping to perpetuate it. And you're making it almost impossible to be healed. And when you do heal, it's more, heal, it's more or less accidentally or because you have caught some absolute statement of truth which has made you rise higher than your own beliefs. In other words, <clears throat> if you are a thief, don't condemn yourself. It is not your fault, and it is not your nature. And if you are too sensual, don't try to correct yourself and to be the opposite of that, whatever the opposite may be. If you are envious or jealous or malicious, don't try to stop it and don't try to make it something else because if you succeed, you will just still be a human being with a little different qualities than you had before. Probably a little better, but you'll still be a human being. In other words, you'll just be a person who has psychologized themselves into suppressing that which is within them until sometime it breaks out like spring. The evil that is finding expression in you, the error, whether it is finding expression as a disease, as a false trait, as an evil character, as a false appetite, has absolutely nothing to do with you. It didn't begin in you, and uh, you will never root it out of you. You never will. It was the reason that Dr. Menninger was able to say on a uh, nationwide broadcast that in his experience in psychology, not a single cure of anything has ever been achieved. Of course, we believe we're on the right track, but in 75 years we haven't proven it in a single case. Why? Because the basis of it is that the error is within you and we'll find it and correct it. But they haven't found it in you, and if they did, they couldn't correct it. Now then, <clears throat> evil has its origin in something that we may for this moment term the carnal mind. If the carnal mind means nothing to you, you can call it Satan. And if Satan is too far back in your religious life to have any meaning, you can call it mortal mind. If you don't like Satan, carnal mind or mortal mind. You can call it an appearance, a claim, or an illusion. The name you give it is unimportant. The important thing is to know that it is a universal, impersonal source of any and every form of evil. Unless you can do that, in other words, Unless you can see a man stealing a pocketbook and then say, thank God I know you aren't the thief. The carnal mind is behind this, or mortal mind. 
or claim, unless you can separate that evil from that individual, you haven't a ghost of a show of helium. If you are confronted with a case of cancer and you are tempted to believe that jealousy, hatred, sensuality caused it, you haven't a chance to be a good healer, even if accidentally you do heal someone once in a while. Because none of those things cause cancer. Cancers have been caused in newborn babies, and they haven't had a chance yet to be hateful or sensual or anything else. And there are some mighty fine pure men and women in the world who have these diseases who never knew such things as hate or sensuality or jealousy to the extent of causing a cancer. Oh no. Unless you can instantly impersonalize by realizing that this claim has its origin in an impersonal source, whether you call it carnal mind or mortal mind makes no difference, but don't have it in your patient, don't have it in your student, and above all things, don't have it in yourself. And right here I'm going to tell you why. You might as well know it at the beginning because I know you're all students of many years standing. The reason is God constitutes your identity. Your name is I. And you know it, you call yourself I. It's the only way you can identify yourself is as I. And that I is your identity, but that I is God. And how dare you say that it has evil qualities and propensities. I have no e evil qualities or propensities. Paul recognized that when he said, I do not sin. I do feel a sense of sin in me, but it isn't mine. And so it is that you and I may say, there are times we feel sensual. Maybe there are times we even feel envious. But don't start condemning yourself. That is just a universal thing that you've picked up out of the ether. And it has no relationship to you because the minute you know that I am I, I and my Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine, you'll know you have no evil qualities, no evil propensities, no evil characteristics, and that any that are within you, they are but the projection of that which we will call carnal mind or mortal mind or Satan, meaning impersonal source of evil. Now, when you have done this, you have got your patient about half cured. As long as you lift the burden of guilt from them, you have them just about half cured and you can complete it with the next step. Although, for Christians, the next step is going to be a bitter pill to swallow. In the next step, you will have to agree that St. Paul made a terrible mistake. That St. Paul made a mistake that has helped to keep us in bondage. St. Paul made a mistake that has been fatal to the world. He said, the carnal mind is enmity against God. And don't you believe it. His saying that caused him to be put in prison almost every week, beaten up almost every week, finally thrown into prison until he was dead. He came upon the most horrible experiences of any religious teacher that ever lived. No one ever suffered what Paul did. Jesus may have suffered more in five minutes, but Paul suffered it for years because of his own mistaken conclusion that the carnal mind... Now remember, he impersonalized, all right. He didn't blame anyone for his troubles. He didn't say it was the Romans or the Greeks or the Jews. He knew it was the carnal mind, but he didn't know that the carnal mind is not enmity against God. The carnal mind is the arm of flesh or nothingness. The carnal mind is a belief in two powers. Anywhere that the belief in two powers exists, 
you have a carnal mind. And to whatever extent that you and I still believe in two powers, and remember that every one of us believes in it to some extent. Some of us have come further out of it than others, but there isn't anyone on earth that is living now, in fact none that we know that has ever lived, that came completely out of good and evil until after the resurrection. But each one of us on the metaphysical path has already come out to some extent. I mean, for instance, there's probably no one in this room who could be called to uh, a case of infectious or contagious disease that wouldn't go out and answer it immediately without any fear that they would take on the contagion or infection. Why? Because everyone on this path has already gone far enough to know that since God is the only power, this infection or contagion is nothing but a belief of power, and therefore we don't concern ourselves with it. And so when we go to those cases, we don't bathe in alcohol and put masks on. We just walk in as we are and walk out as we are, and no one ever comes away with any disease. But the chances are that if uh, we were to hear this afternoon that there would probably be an atomic bomb dropped on us tonight, probably we wouldn't quite have that same unconcern and say, well, what of it? If God is the only power, I can't see what difference it makes if they drop bombs all around us. Now, actually, however, that should be the attitude of every individual on the spiritual path. Where I am, God is, or as the Hebrew prophet Hezekiah said, when told that the enemy is coming against us and there are more than of them than of us. And Hezekiah said, they have only the arm of flesh, temporal power. We have the Lord God almighty. In other words, we have all might and they have none. Their numbers do not constitute power. Their guns do not constitute power because God is all power. Therefore, numbers and guns are no power. So it is that every individual who knew this in the wartime, and it made no difference what side they were on, if only they knew that God is all power, they could walk right out on the battlefront and nothing could by any manner of means come nigh their dwelling place. Because... If you believe that an atomic bomb has power, which you know the world does believe, then you are in the midst of the only error there is in life, the belief in two powers. Many people still cling to that superstitious mythology that's taught about Adam and Eve having uh, been thrown out of the Garden of Eden because of sex. Well, I suppose if you want to keep people behaving, it's a good whip to hold over their head. But of course it never was true. There wasn't a word of truth in it. The Bible clearly states why they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's all there is to you and to me as humans to the degree that we accept the belief of two powers, good and evil. In that degree are we the victims not of two powers, because there aren't two powers, but we are the victims of the belief of two powers. And remember this, don't personalize it, it isn't your belief. It's a universal belief which you are momentarily accepting. Now then, if you will remember that the origin of evil is the belief in two powers, you will have the basic secret of life, that which the ancients sought, and that which some of them discovered and found they could not teach to mankind. The origin of evil is the universal belief in two powers. And the moment a child is conceived, they are under that law. And the only way that it can be avoided is if their parents, before conception, have become aware of the fact 
that man is not a creator, neither the mind of man nor the body of man. God alone is creator, and God is the one and only power, and all creation is subject unto God, and only unto God, then they will bring forth a child free right from birth of this belief in two powers and they will function as a child of God. In other words, they will not be under the dominion of the belief about babies and the belief about child sicknesses and so forth and so forth and so on. I do not know what your record is, uh, those of you who are in unity, for I've never heard. But I have investigated the record in Christian science. And I can tell you that children from Christian science homes average only 20% of the absences from school for sickness of the other children. Only 20% taking a broad tabulation from coast to coast. In other words, whatever degree the Christian science home knows that a child doesn't live under law but under grace brings them at least that much freedom. Now to go the next step and to really understand the origin of evil and to know that it only exists as a belief in two powers, a universal belief, never your belief, never his belief, never its belief, just a belief, and then to take the next step and realize this belief in two powers, which we call the carnal mind or mortal mind, is not a power, is not a cause, it is the arm of flesh or nothingness. It is a belief, it is an illusion, it is an appearance, but it has no reality and it has no law, and let me tell you why. It isn't God ordained. God never created two powers, and God never created a belief in two powers. Therefore, there is no God ordination in that belief. There is no God power in that belief. There is no power of sustenance or maintenance to that belief. And all that is required is for an individual to know the truth. And to know the truth is what God did not create was not made, was not empowered. And therefore, the belief in good and evil was not God made, is not God ordained, is not God sustained, and has no law of God to perpetuate it. Therefore, the first step in our healing work is impersonalizing the evil, removing it from the person, never being guilty of saying he, she, or it, always removing it out into the universal carnal mind, then taking the second step and declaring this is not enmity against God, this is a belief without God, without law, without presence, without power, and you will find that you've accomplished 75 to 80 percent of your healing work. Actually, you will find this. Healing work should be accomplished quickly and completely in at least 75 to 80 percent of all our cases. In other words, every day we should be able to clean up at least 75 percent of the cases that come to us. They are so simple. In other words, they don't have their foundation in the patient at all. They don't have their foundation in anything that the patient is responsible for. And by recognizing the universal, impersonal nature of them and the impotency of it, you remove it. I'll illustrate that this way. Let us take uh, the flu epidemic. Nobody's responsible for having flu. You can't blame a person or look for the qualities that brought them flu. 
It's just something flying around in the atmosphere and they pick it up. Therefore, when one individual recognizes that this <clears throat> epidemic is a universal belief, not personal to anybody, and uh, that it has no law of God sustaining it, you've stopped it. And you may have experiences such as I have had where every case that came to my office in a whole day was met on the day it came in without ever thinking about a patient or being concerned who called in or when. Just keeping thought out here on the idea that this is nothing but a universal claim of a selfhood apart from God or of a law apart from God or an activity apart from God and because it isn't personal and because it isn't power it is this arm of flesh or nothingness that takes care of it. In the same way easily 75 or 80 percent of all the claims that afflict individuals are very quickly met through this method of treatment. Where you get into your difficulty is with the other 20 percent. That is where a practitioner really has to earn their fees, if they have any, or their gifts or love offerings or whatever it is that they have, they're going to earn them with that 20 percent. Why? <clears throat> that is the portion that the Master says, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And that's where the individual practitioner has to rise high in consciousness to meet those cases. And if my own experience is any criterion, you don't meet all of them. But you can meet a great amount of them. You can come to where you can say, I'm meeting 90 to 95 percent of all the cases that come to me. And the rest, I've still got to go higher before I can attain the consciousness that will meet them. Now, this <clears throat> discovery led to all that has taken place in uh, my 30 years of experience that brought this work around the world. But it was only a step. It was what you might call the curative step, but not the preventative. That came later. When it was revealed to me that we individually can escape 90 or more percent of all the evils that beset the world. We can live a life completely free of lack and limitation no matter to what extent lack and limitation might hit the world. We can live in health regardless of what extent disease hits the world. We actually can demonstrate that none of these things will come nigh my dwelling place, but we have to do it through the understanding and application of certain principles. In our work, we call this protective work. Not meaning protective work that we protect ourselves from any people or races or religions, or that we protect ourselves from any sins or diseases, far be it from such. Our protective work is the protection against our acceptance of these universal beliefs. Now, <clears throat> since naturally I cannot in a short time go through all of these principles with you, with you I will tell you where they may be found in my writings so that you can work specifically, those of you who would like to, with these principles and see if they fit into your particular way of life. The subject of protective work is found in a chapter named protective work in the book Infinite Way Letters, 1955. 
and again in a letter which will appear June 1960. Those are the two papers on protective work. In uh, this protective work, the idea is that an individual waking in the morning is really waking up into this world, the world of laws, laws of matter, laws of mind, laws of two powers, and that he or she must consciously remove themselves from this world of two powers. Come out and be separate and place yourself under grace. Now, there is no power outside of you going to do that for you. That is why life goes on eternally showing these principles to us, I mean these problems, because we do not remove ourselves. And to be free of the world, we must consciously remove ourselves from under the law and place ourselves under grace. And that must be done every single day of the week. I do not know anyone who has grown old enough or advanced enough to omit the daily conscious realization that since I am I, I am not under the law, but under grace. That since I am I, there are no laws external to me acting upon me, for I am the law and I am the dominion unto this world. This is truth, but if you don't consciously make it so in your experience, you cannot demonstrate it. In handling problems of human relationships, whether they're marital, filial, neighborly, whether they're community, national, international, there are two chapters. Love thy neighbor in practicing the presence and the relationship of oneness in the art of spiritual healing. Now, to you, of course, most of you, this is not known, that we have had tremendous success in working with corporations and unions. Wherever we have been called in, there are no more strikes, and there is no more strife. We have solved the problem of capital and labor relationships, not on the scale of eliminating all the troubles in the world on them, only eliminating them from those unions or corporations where there is someone willing to work and live by these principles, and we really have done a marvelous job with some big corporations in ending their strikes and uh, preventing any further ones. There is no avenue of human relationships where this principle cannot be applied, where it cannot be solved. It has even been solved in the case of uh, epidemics that have hit public schools. And this work has been called in and stopped the epidemic in 24 hours. Now, it means working with specific principles. Now, the principles of healing work, treatment work, are to be found in the May and June 1960 letters, the newest letters. They are also to be found in uh, June, September, October, November 1959, but that book won't be available until October. There are no more copies of the original letters available, and uh, unless you can borrow copies from those who have them, the only way to get them will be when the Infinite Way Letters 1959 are released, which will be about October. But meanwhile, you will at least have May and June 1960. Then, of course, the book, The Art of Spiritual Healing, contains the foundation for all of our treatment and healing work. The books... Practicing the Presence and the Art of Meditation are exactly what their titles indicate. They are merely foundational works for bringing individuals who have not yet 
come into the life of practicing the presence of God or who have not attained perfection or uh, ability in meditation, they are the helps for them. They are just foundational books. But after those books and uh, after the Infinite Way letters, and of course these books, Infinite Way letters, contain these principles that I have been teaching our practitioners and serious students because our letters go only to our serious students. No one receives our monthly letter unless they personally request them and then they are discontinued at the end of the year unless they are again personally requested. And every year those who receive them must specifically request them. Why? They are the highest unfoldment of which I have been uh, capable of receiving and I don't want them lying around the world where those who do not know or appreciate will be concerned with them. I never withhold anything from my monthly letters that I know and that will help a serious student and therefore I know that somebody may want them this year but by next year discover that this isn't their path and therefore I don't want them to have them unless they want them and if so they'll have to ask for them and I even know that students have been on the path five years and decided that they found something easier or better or simpler and so it is that these letters have been uh, in circulation since 1954 and those who receive them must specifically request them every January. Then they are continued. Now, those uh, who wish to be with these principles could start with the Infinite Way Letters 1954 and then bring themselves up to 1959 and 60 uh, as slowly or as rapidly as they wish to go through those books. The book, The Infinite Way, is our major textbook and I have very little hope that there will be many people grasp the uh, book without a background that will enable them to find what is in it because that book is a book of principles. There isn't, I don't believe, an extraneous word or sentence in it there's nothing in it but principles and sometimes one sentence or one paragraph is enough to live with for a long time to come and therefore it is our deepest uh, book of, as used as a textbook. The rest of the books are class books and they contain all of these principles as they have been given in different classes because as you have seen all of my work is recorded and eventually gets into print. And that these things appear in print as letters, as books, as magazine articles. There is a magazine in the United States that publishes an infinite way article in every issue. There is an, a magazine in England, there is a magazine in Australia, and a magazine in India. And with every publication there is an Infinite Way article and right now we have a complete Infinite Way magazine but it's published only in German and is available only in German but it is made up of principally the letters and the articles that have already appeared in print. <laughs>